Welcome, everyone. Uh, we're back to the afternoon sessions. And uh, today, we have with us uh, Martin Moldes. That is going to give us uh, the laydown of LTS, TLS, and certificates, security, and so many other things. So, Martin, how are you? I'm fine. Thank you, Andres. It's, uh, it's a nice... Uh, <laughs> A free letter acronym to say TLS, but unfortunately, we're not going to cover T, uh, TLS today. Uh, I mean, not <laughs> covering LTS today. Oh, no, now you got me confused, man. <laughs> <laughs> See? <laughs> yeah, well, sorry about that. Um, but anyway, no so um, we're very, very happy to have you here uh, with us. Um, and, uh, so, what the next I'm going to do is uh, give you the well, you have the floor, Marte. So, please take it away. Perfect. Thank you, Andres. So hi, everyone. Good afternoon. Um, as Andres already said, my name is Martin Mulders. I work in the Netherlands at InfoSupport, which is mainly a consultancy firm. And what we typically do is uh, when we talk about technology and we're enthusiastic about that piece of technology, we coined the term, the term awesome sauce. You saw it already in the previous uh, intro slide. Uh, you might see it even in the corner here. So that's the stuff that we get enthusiastic about. But today we're talking transport layer security. And I don't know about you, but is that actually awesome sauce? Is that something to be enthusiastic about? Or is it more, well, you know, it's the hard stuff. It's the stuff that gives me a headache because, well, it often goes wrong. Uh, literally this morning, I had a call from somebody. Hey, Martin, you know about TLS, please help me out. I'm, I'm not sure what's going wrong, but I'm pretty sure it doesn't work. And I don't know about you, but if you see these kind of stack traces, very long stack traces, cryptic messages, uh, things starting with sun.security, that's always a bad sign. I mean, in the LTS versions of Java, hey, see, we even were to use LTS today. Uh, we're, we're told not to use the com sun internals, and here we are, sun.net.www, sun security, SSL, well. I'm not happy when I see that. And there used to be a time back in the days when I was seeing these kind of stack traces, I would go to a colleague of mine. Uh, why? Because he actually knew about this kind of stuff. He was very, he still is, by the way, very knowledgeable when it comes to security in the Java virtual machine. And I would go to him and ask him, hey, can you please help me out? Because I don't know what to do. And at one point in time, I was like, this is not cool if I consider myself a professional. I want to know at least the basics about transport layer security. I want to know the basic places where I can start looking for stuff when it goes wrong. And that's how this talk originated. And that's already been more than three years ago, but I still am very happy that I took the step to start studying it. And I'm happy to share with you today all the things that I've learned. So why are we actually talking about it? because transport layer security is getting more and more important in today's world. We're building distributed application architectures. They span multiple clouds, multiple regions, multiple data centers. And the only reason it works is because those systems are connected. But if that connection is spanning the, the whole globe, we must take care that nobody's eavesdropping on us because often we build applications that process sensitive data, whether it's personal identifiable information, financial transactions, or anything else, we want to be sure that it's secured and that no one can actually read along. And how do we do that? Well, that's where transport layer security kicks in. You may be familiar with the OSI model, which describes the seven layers of a connection between two systems. At the, very at the very bottom, you find the physical layer, which is all about the, the cables, the wires, and the signals that go over the wire. And at the very top, you find the application layer, which is about applications talking to each other. And just below the top, in the second layer, you find the presentation layer. And in the OSI model, the presentation layer is responsible for data representation and encryption which says basically if you want your data to be encrypted it's something that you are solving over there in the presentation layer 
it almost becomes an application concern to do it. Now, transport layer security takes a different approach and moves that responsibility down to the transport layer, quite a few layers below. What does that mean? That means that as soon as we have a session, our application has a connected session with another application, it can rely on the fact that the transport is secured and that no one can eavesdrop on that. Well, how that works, that's what we're going to discuss today. But a talk like this would not be complete if we wouldn't cover history. And there always has to be those one or two slides that are a bit boring. Well, this is one of them. It all started with SSL 1.0, invented by Netscape Labs, but never released just because it wasn't good enough. SSL 2.0 was the first version to be released into the public and it, had, it has had its time. It took until 2011 until security researchers discovered that it was not secure anymore. They published the Poodle attack, which made it possible to, uh, to intercept a secure socket layer. The Poodle attack a few years later also proved to be able to break SSL 3.0, which was released only one year after SSL 2.0. But security researchers on the other end hadn't stood still anyway. In 1999, they published Transport Layer Security 1.0. It also lasted until 2011 when another attack was published, the Beast attack, which also made that protocol unsafe to use. So we're left with TLS 1.1, 1.2, and 1.3, where TLS 1.3 was only introduced relatively recently, just 2018. There's no end date for those three entries. That's not I'm not saying they are per se secure. It's just as with testing your code, we didn't have, we don't have evidence yet that they are unsecure. But that's not the same as we have evidence they are secure. Nobody has published an attack showing it's insecure. Maybe there is a backdoor and we don't know about it. That's always a caveat that we must be aware of. But when in doubt, just go for the latest release. That's in this case, a pretty sane advice. So before we dive any further, let me do a quick demonstration so that we are on the same page discussing transport layer security. Here, I have a very simple web page just running on local host, and you can see the text isn't that interesting. And here, let me start a package sniffer. T-Shark, part of the Wireshark software package. And it will capture every network packet that goes over the wire. So when I refresh the page and I look at the inter intercepted packages, I can see the whole network packet traffic that went over the network card. It's not formatted in a nice way, but we can see the browser doing an doing a get using HTTP 1.1, the host name, a lot of headers over there, not so interesting. And more importantly, when the server responds, we can see lorem ipsum and the rest. This is basically the request body that went back over the wire to my client, the web browser. And it, this means that if we are in a situation like this, an eavesdropper can read both requests and response. Now, lorem ipsum isn't particularly secret data, but you can imagine that this would not be so much fun when I was talking to my internet banking environment. If an eavesdropper could read my transactions, I would be pretty upset. If they could read my login credentials, I would be even more upset. Now, that's what transport layer security is going to address for us. And to make that work, we need to look at three things public private key encryption, signed certificates, and certificate authorities. And that's go roughly the structure for the remainder of the talk. So let's get started with public private key encryption. This is typically the stuff that you need a PhD in mathematics to understand. And I don't know about you, I don't have one, but what I can do, I can construct Swedish furniture. And luckily, we've got some diagrams in exactly that language that can help us understand 
how it all works. So let's look at public and private key encryption or asymmetric encryption by use of this picture. You can see asymmetric encryption as a kind of safe. And the safe has a lock, obviously. Now the lock needs two keys or it actually accepts two keys. One of the keys has a globe on it, and that's a public key. The other say the other key has my face on it. That's the private key. And that's why we also refer to this asymmetric encryption because the two keys are not the same. One key, the public key, as the name suggests, is public, and each and every one of you can have it if you want to. The private key, on the other hand, is mine, and I'm the only one that has access to it. Now, if any of you would like to send me a message, they have the public key at their availability, they can write me that message, put it in the safe, and then close the safe using the key they have, the public key. Now that the key is closed, the, excuse me, now that the lock is closed, it can be put on any insecure transport. In this case, we're looking at a truck, could be a pigeon if it was strong enough to carry a lock, could be, well, re really everything. It doesn't have to be secure. The only thing is that it needs to get the lock to my address. And when it gets there, remember, I'm the only one that has the private key. So I can open the lock, find the letter that is inside and read it. And because I am the only one that has the private key, you can be sure as soon as you send me a message, there will be only one person who's going to read it. And you can put whatever you like in that letter because no one else is going to read it. So asymmetric encryption, two types of keys, the public key that's used by the sender, the private key that's used by the receiver to actually read the message. Well, of course, in reality, it's not about a lock with a key and a truck. It's all about mathematics. Let's look at a simplified version of how that works. Again, this is a simplified version. This is roughly how RSA works, one of the more popular um, encryption schemes. But please keep in mind, it's more com complicated than this. So to send, we start by selecting two prime numbers. Let's call them P and Q. And they are random. So I chose 11 and 17. And we multiply them which gives us 187. Now we select a third random number, uh, which is only constrained by the fact that it must be smaller than the product that we just calculated. We call it the number E, and in this example, we have the value three. And here's a little mathematic puzzle for you. Can you please solve the equation that I've written down there? D multiplied with E minus one modulo P minus Q multiplied with Q minus one must be equal to zero. Well, as you can see, this is a mathematical equation with one unknown. So we can solve it. I'll save you the steps, but let's just say that we end up with a value of D, that was the only unknown, must be 107. If we fill in D is 107, and the, the other numbers, P and Q and E, we will see that the equation is valid. The modulo is zero. Also note that if I would have selected another random number, E over there, the value of D would change accordingly. So for instance, if E would have been 75, D would have been 183. And this is important, that random number basically protects us against a replay attack. If somebody would ever find D, I could simply choose another number for E and we would again be safe. Now, what if P and Q are unknown? So we do know that P multiplied with Q is 299 and that E equals five. And again, here's the equation. Please find a D for which the equation holds true. Well, even with a little uh, mathematical background, you can say, hey, there's more than one unknown. I'm not sure if I'm going to be able to solve this equation. If you don't know P and Q, it's hard to solve this equation because there we have the individual number P and the individual number Q, and we don't know what these are. We only know that 
When multiplied, they are 299. If you do know P and Q, you would know, for instance, P is 13, Q is 23. Then calculating D is relatively easy again. And for any modern CPU, it's a matter of microseconds before it knows the value. That's the easy part again. Now, if P and Q are just big enough numbers, so not 13 and 23, but somewhere in the thousands or millions, as long as they satisfy the other requirements, which are that they must be prime numbers, then any modern computer will take an eternity to actually find those factors. And that's the power of the scheme we're discussing here, because it means we can safely distribute the result of multiplying P and Q, and we can distribute the random number E in an unsecure way, in a way where anybody could eavesdrop because the individual numbers P and Q are kept private. So if we would apply this to encrypting a piece of text, for instance, because at the end of the day, we're not encrypting numbers, we want to encrypt pictures or text, then we first must translate that text, which in this case is the letter G, to a number. Uh, we're doing a very simple approach here. The G is the seventh letter of the alphabet. So let's go for that. Again, P multiplied with Q is 187, E is three, and the letter G translates into a seven. We take that input, we raise it to the power of E, so we raise it to the third power, that gives us 343. We then modulo with 187, which yields 156. Now, on the receiving end, we only receive 156, and we know it's ciphertext, we know it's encrypted, so we want to decrypt it, but we know the individual values of P and Q. And that means that we can calculate the number D. Again, that's 107. What we do, we take the ciphertext, 156, we raise it to the power of D, so that's to the power of 107. Here it becomes a bit tricky. You have to trust me on this one. That's roughly 4.6 4 with 234 zeros behind it. I'm saying roughly because Excel isn't going to do it for you. Your mobile phone calculator app isn't going to do it for you. But that's roughly the, the outcome of that number. We aren't particularly interested in that number because the next thing we're going to do is we're going to take the modulo with 187. And we will find back the number seven, which is the letter G. So there we are, we have decrypted our input because we knew the original values of P and Q, and hence we knew the original value of D. Uh, fairy tale figures is, no, 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 that's, there's no time for that. We've got a lot of serious stuff to cover and it's, fairy tales is certainly not one of them. Here's one of those other boring slides, which roughly describes how clients and servers connect to each other using transport layer security. Of course, it starts with a client who wants to initiate a connection to the server. And it will politely say hello. And the server, also being very polite, will say hello back. It will then offer a certificate, and we will see in a few minutes what that actually is. Exchange some key material, and then consider the hello phase to be done. The client will, in turn, respond by exchanging some more key materials. And then, number seven, that's an important one, it will say, hey, we're going to change ciphers. Everything that we exchanged until now was out in the open, but now I'm going to change to using a cipher and I expect you to do the same. And then it considers the negotiation to be finished and the server will respond and basically confirm, yes, everything we are going to exchange from now on is going to be secured using the cipher that you asked me for. Now, this also is a bit simplified what happens in reality is that in this phase, we're doing the asymmetric encryption, but because asymmetric encryption is a bit expensive in terms of calculations, one of the first things that happens after this is that now that the, tra now that the transport layer has been secured, the client and server go back basically one step uh, 
and, and lower the requirements a bit, they generate symmetric keys because that's mathematically much simpler to do and it hence requires less computational power to do it. But they exchange the symmetric keys for that over a secured transport layer so nobody can see that it's actually happening. And with symmetric keys, as you may have figured, if asymmetric, asymmetric keys means that the client and the server have different keys, symmetric keys mean that they have the same key pair. They both hold the same key. And that's fine. That's basically how you would do encryption when you were at primary school, or at least that's how I did it when I was at primary school. So time for a second demo. Let's make sure that what we've seen so far, nobody's going to eavesdrop on us. This was the page I had first, and here I have it again. What you cannot see probably, maybe I can show you like this. Yeah, is that we now have a little lock in front of there and Chrome is saying the connection is secure. It's a bit small probably, but you have to trust me on that. So I'm going to refresh this page as well, keeping an eye on the packet sniffer, clear on the screen a bit like so, refreshing the page. And now what we see here, wow, that's quite a lot of stuff happening. Wow, ah, there we go. That's the done part, like so. So there's a lot of data being exchanged, and sometimes we can read one or two words, like local host over there or HTTP. Again, local host. There it's, it gives Martin at Etsche, which is the name of the machine, and there's Mixer Development, which is the certificate issuer. Well, that's all, all fine and good. That's nothing secret. But the actual HTTP traffic, you can't find it anymore, anymore. It's encrypted. So this means that we now have a secure way of talking to a remote system, whether it is another ap application that we're building, or maybe it's my internet banking environment. Yeah, let's. So, so much for that. The second thing that we need is signed certificates. I already dropped the word certificate a few times. Let's see what that actually means. A certificate is basically a document that makes a statement about a subject. So about something or somebody having a particular property. And you could think of a certificate as, for example, your driver's license. That is a certificate. It's your government saying you are allowed, you have proven to be able to drive a vehicle. And that certificate, my driver's license, has an expiry date, by which date I should renew it. It is issued to a subject, that would be me. It even has a usage saying I can drive a car, but I am not allowed to drive a motorbike or a truck or a bus, unfortunately. And just like those certificates in the real world, a digital certificate is pretty similar. It's issued to somebody, usually to a domain name. It has a validity, so it expires at a certain date. It is suitable for some usage, but not for all usages. So it's it may be uh, a very common thing is that it's suitable for um, for exchanging data in a secure way, but not for identification purposes. And it has a public key. That's the important thing. The certificate says, hey, www.devoc.co.uk is the legal owner of a particular public key. And remember that public key is something that the sender will use to send messages to the recipient. A certificate also has a fingerprint algorithm and more importantly, the actual fingerprint, which makes it a lot easier to inspect if you're looking at the right certificate or not. Because if anything from the other fields changes, the fingerprint would change as well. So if you want a quick way to see if a certificate is valid, 
you compare the fingerprint with something you already know. But given the fact that a certificate could be issued by anyone, a certificate needs an issuer. That's somebody else who issued the certificate to me and they put their signature on it. And just, with, just as with the fingerprint, we also need to specify which algorithm was used to calculate the signature. And that means we need a way to actually generate a digital signature. And you wouldn't have guessed, but then again, we can use public and private keys. And it looks similarly, but of course different. So let's say there's somebody who wants to send me that message. And apart from using my public key to close the lock, they actually put a lock in a lock. So they first write their message, they close the first lock, and they close it with their private key. Then they put it potentially in another lock to send it to me, but that's not required. So they close it with their own key, put it on any insecure transport, and then anybody who receives the lock can use the public key to open the lock and find the letter inside. And because they know the public key is owned by that friendly person over there, they know that that person is the one who closed the lock. And they know that whatever is in the lock is genuinely their message. Now imagine we have a bad guy over there. You can see he's very bad. He has uh, uh, this little thing before his eye, so he's probably a criminal or something. And he wants to send a message as if he was the friendly guy over there. He uses the private key that he has, but it's a different private key. Now, if any recipient finds that lock and wants to inspect the message, they will use the public key of the person they expect to have sent the letter, the friendly guy. But that key doesn't work. The lock doesn't want to open. And because the lock doesn't open, they know that whatever they would have found inside is not generally inside by that person, but rather by somebody else, a bad person. And we are not interested in any message from a bad person. Again, there's a lot of mathematics going on behind it. If we would look at it from a mathematical perspective, we could say that a signature is actually two things. It's a signing function, which takes the private key and the message, and it returns some value T. And the signature also is a verifying function, which takes the message, the signature, and the public key, and responds with saying either accept or reject. And based on that, you can determine for yourself if you want to trust the message X or not. So we know how to sign certificates. We know that certificates certify that somebody is the owner of a public key and hence of the corresponding private key. Now, the only question is who is going to create those certificates for us? Is it going to be the driver's department in my country that also issued my driver's license? Well, of course not. So we have certificate authorities. So what is that? A certificate authority is, a, is an entity. Usually it's a commercial entity, but there are also non-profit certificate authorities like Let's Encrypt. And they issue those digital certificates that we've just discussed. And as I said, those certificates certify that some subject, the owner of the certificate, is also the owner of a public key. What happens here is that I'm talking to somebody that I haven't met before, the question mark over there, and I'm wondering myself, can I trust them or not? And the answer is, well, they are trusted by Alice. Alice happens to be trusted by John. And as I mentioned in the intro, I know John very well and I trust him. So given that I trust John and John trusts Alice, I know I can trust this person over there, the question mark that I've never met. That sounds good and it sounds all fine, but the thing is, who is John? It may be my colleague, which is good, but reality is a bit more harsh. 
There are 160 Johns in any modern computer nowadays. If you would open up the key store of, of uh, the keychain of Mac OS, or if you would look into the CA search file of any modern Java distribution, or you would look at the Windows Trust Store, you will find roughly 160 commercial companies that issue digital certificates. And I don't know about you, but I haven't checked all of them. So what actually happens is that I'm putting my trust into Apple for carefully selecting them and putting them in the Mac OS keychain, or I'm tr putting my trust in Oracle for shipping a, a decent CA search file, or, well, you can think of yourself who you are trusting. And it's up to you to think if that's a wise decision or not. I can't judge. But that's what happens in reality. John is the person that fills your system key store, your system trust store. So luckily, those certificate authorities are top-notch companies and they have accordingly top-notch security procedures and one of the procedures that is most important to them is the key exchange ceremony this is actual footage from a key exchange ceremony at one of the companies that issues digital certificates and what you can see here is people sitting in the front of the room doing the actual procedure and a lot of people observing what's actually happened. As you can see, this picture is definitely pre-COVID times. But apart from that, there's a few interesting things to see here. The observants all have received a copy of the checklist. And except, uh, except for that one guy who is checking his phone, they are paying attention as to whether the people there in the front are actually following the procedures. There are cameras all in the room, all over the room, and this footage comes from one of them, that observe every detail of what is happening in the room. And the procedure describes what to do to rotate the keys that are used to issue those certificates. And usually they even have notaries that are checking if everything goes well. They may even ask a few strangers from the street to join so that no one can influence the observers. And by having so many people verify the process, and by having so such a strict process, they want to be sure that the actual key materials are kept safe at all times. That looks good, and that sounds good, doesn't it? But still, bad things can happen. And we still have a few minutes left, so I can tell you one time when it went wrong. People who are from the Netherlands, like me, may recognize this picture. But given that most of you are probably from Britain, this is Beverwijk. It's a small town a little north of Amsterdam. And back in the days, there was a notary living here in Beverwijk who heard about di digital certificates and thought, well, maybe I can make a nice business out of this. So what they started to do, they started issuing digital certificates. And that was actually booming business. Back in the days, we're talking roughly around the dot-com bubble hype thingy. So they made a lot of money and well, security, well, not exactly our expertise, but we'll manage, right? We'll manage. But one day something really bad happened. An attacker was able to compromise one of their web servers. So that, that's one of the servers that, that hosted their website. That website was built using .NET Nuke. And I'm not saying .NET, .NET is insecure. I'm just mentioning it was not Java, right? It wasn't Java. So .NET. Um, and there was a file upload vulnerability in .NET Nuke. And they were able to exploit that vulnerability and get access to the password store of that web server. And now it shows why security is so important at all fit, at all pieces of your organization. Because somebody thought it would be a good idea to have a web server running in the same domain 
as the server that hosted the actual private key that was used to sign digital certificates. And using that domain administrator password, the attacker was able to traverse the whole network infrastructure until they reached the machine that actually had the private key available. And unfortunately, I can't look you into the eyes, but take just a single second to think what this actually means. If an attacker is able to have access to the private keys of a certificate of authority, that means that they can issue a digital certificate that will be trusted by the whole world. And that's precisely what happened. So in the days thereafter, when the leak uh, appeared public, Google quickly updated 247 certificates that they had shipped with the Chromium browser to no longer trust them. Microsoft removed the DigiNota, because that's the company we're talking about, the DigiNota root certificate from all supported Windows releases back in the days. Mozilla revoked trust in the DigiNota root certificate in all versions of Firefox, Thunderbird, and what other products they had. And Apple issued security update 2011.005. You would say that's a decent response, but the devil is in the details. There's a little asterisk over there. The Windows release was not rolled out to the Netherlands. And the reason for that was that one of the customers of DigiNotar was the Dutch state. And the Dutch government was actually afraid that if that root certificate would not be trusted by Windows, that all people in public service would no longer be able to access internal systems. And uh, ci civilians would not be able to use uh, government websites. And that's correct, by the way, that would indeed be the case. So the Dutch government kindly asked Microsoft to keep the update not rolled out for the Netherlands for a week or something, so they had time to actually replace those certificates. And it's a bit as if after a long day of work, you come home and you find that the key that was always be under your doormat had been found by somebody and that somebody had used the key to break into your house and steal stuff. And who knows, they might have made a copy as well. But rather than replacing the locks immediately, you decide to keep it as is because tomorrow the house cleaner will come and it would be a pity if they could not get, at, uh, could not get into your house to actually clean it. That's basically what the Dutch government was doing here. And to make things even more worse, the responsible government official said, people, nothing to worry about, just double check that there's a green lock in your address bar. If it's there, you're good to go. Which is exactly what was not the case because you could no longer trust that green check mark. Well, what eventually should have happened is and also happened, by the way, is that DigiNotar updated their certificate revocation lists. Those lists are published by every certificate authority to actually say, hey, we have issued this or that certificate in the past, but you should no longer trust it. So a final demo showing you what the worth is of the trust that we can have right now or cannot have. So this, for example, is my web browser again. And you can see there a little check mark. I'm trying to zoom it in for you a little bit, but somehow that doesn't work today. I'm sorry for that. There is a, there is a lock saying it's a secure connection, but it's not. I made a little typo over there and you may be able to see it. It says Google with three O's. What I did, I created a certificate for Google with three O's dot NL. I imported that certificate into my web browser and now my browser thinks the connection is secure. But in fact, given that I, both in my capability of attacker and my capability of user, but this time it's the attacker one, 
I was able to inject this certificate into my computer, I can still intercept the traffic because I am able to influence that certificate. So what trust can we derive from certificates? It's the trust that we talk with the system that we ask for, but that is not the same as I can trust I'm talking to the organization that I asked for. If I, made a, if I make a typo and I go to a different address than I intended, but it looks the same, I'm still talking to a, po a potentially malicious organization. That's what EV certificates try to solve which is basically a way for companies to pay even more for their certificates. And uh, then they get an extended validation certificate, which says that the certificate authority did not only check, hey, you are indeed the owner of the domain name, but also you are who you claim to be. So I did a check at the Chamber of Commerce, for instance, and verify that you are indeed allowed to ask for such a certificate on behalf of the company that you're claiming to represent. So let's make all things a bit more practical because this was highly theoretical and conceptual. Now back to our day-to-day -day job where we are seeing those stack traces and we don't know how to deal with them. So the first thing that is a, that you can put in your toolbox is the CURL command line utility. It's a tool that allows you to do simple HTTP calls or more complex ones also as well. Uh, but it's an HTTP client that supports transport layer security. If you give it the minus V, the V switch, it will be extra verbose. So it will also log, for instance, the certificates that it saw and, and whether or not it accepted them. And the case switch will turn off validation of any certificate. So it will just assume that any certificate is trusted. You can omit it and then it will check against the trust store of the system. And then you pass it an address and potentially other parameters as well. And you can inspect the traffic and see why or why not the connection was established. If you want to dive a little deeper, you can find the OpenSSL command line tool, which has an S client command, which is for socket client. If you pass it show search and server name, you can connect on any address that you would like on any port number, and it will give you an even more verbose log of what happened and why. If you find yourself in a situation where you are able to build a connection, but then the connection gets dropped because of a cipher mismatch or a protocol mismatch, you can use Nmap. It has a built-in script, which is called SSL enum ciphers. And if you run that script against any address and port, it will list whatever the server is willing to accept. Please take in mind, by the way, that some security tools consider this a uh, an, an, an attack if you run this script. So only use it after consulting with the owner of the system that you are going to use it for troubleshooting because, well, uh, you, you may get blocked for it. If you want to trace TLS traffic or even decrypt it, if you have ownership of the private key, you can use SSL dump, pass it an interface, a port number, a host number, and you can inspect every TLS packet that goes over the wire. And with the AD switches and K and P, you can even decrypt, live decrypt the TLS traffic. If we move to the Java virtual machine, important properties are the Javax Net SSL Trust Store and Javax Net SSL Trust Store password. You can use it to point at a file that contains all the certificates that you want to trust. By default, it is the CA search file that ships with the Java runtime. Again, roughly uh, 160 certificates are in there, but you can replace that with a file that contains, for instance, only one trusted certificate, your internal root certificate agency. Using the trust password, you can also protect that file with a password. Fully detailed, the default password of the JDK trust store is change it. Now, if that's not a nice hint. 
Similarly, we have settings for the key store. And the key store is a file similar to the trust store, except it doesn't contain certificates. It contains public and or private keys. So those are the keys that actually power the encryption that we've talked about. Those are probably even more important than the trust store because the trust store is only about what I'm I going to trust connecting to somebody else. The key store is about who actually has the private key to be on the receiving end of the connection. If you want to troubleshoot why your Java program is not connecting as you expect it, you can pass Javax net debug using only the SSL value. It will include the debug logging for TLS handshaking and connection buildup, but you can pass it additional flags that let you filter in even greater detail what you want to see. For instance, I want to see why the key man, why the correct key pair is not selected, or I want to see why the select the, the correct certificate is not being trusted. If you want to work with key stores and trust stores, I highly recommend to download Portakey because it's way better than the the default key tool command that you will find with the Java runtime. The key tool is a CLI. It's perfect for scripting and such, but it's not very friendly when it comes to inspecting the actual contents of a trust store or a key store. And Portakey makes that a whole lot easier. So wrapping up, I've got a few takeaways for you. The key takeaways or actually the public key takeaways. The first one is that you should never ever use SSL. If somebody does, and especially if it's a security professional, double check whether they are actually asking you to use transport layer security, preferably version 1.2 or even better version 1.3. SSL is old deprecated stuff. It's proven to be insecure, don't use it. The second thing, especially in highly sensitive environments, like for instance, banking or, or basically any place where you process personal information, be careful to, as to whom you trust. That default CA search file that comes with Java, it contains 160 certificate authorities. You probably want to trust only one, which is your internal one, or the one that issued the certificate of the external company you're connecting with. And finally, when you are in doubt or when you are in trouble, open your toolbox, uh, toolbox and know how to use the tools inside. Make sure you have OpenSSL, CURL available, and map an SSL dump for more advanced situations, and particularly to make sure that you can easily manage your trust stores and your key stores. With that, we've come to the end. Andres, do we have any questions from the audience? <coughs> well, thank you very much, Martin. Um, I don't see any questions from the audience, but I do have one in mind, which is, uh, so you mentioned a few of the tools outside of the JVM that you can use to verify and to check. And, and uh, so, but what could you do within uh, the JDK itself? As far as I understand, uh, TLS 1.3 was added recently. It's, it's added to the three major TLS releases that we have, 8, 11, at 17 at this point. Is there something extra that Java developers should be aware of? Um, yeah, that's an interesting one. If you would, would be in the unlucky situation where you are still running Java 7, then <laughs> bad luck. You, 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 you won't be able to benefit from the latest security enhancements. I would highly recommend to, to actually try when you're working on a system that you already know it works to, to just for, for fun, enable this, this flag for a second and see what kind of information you can get from that. Because if you know the, the, the happy type of information, it becomes easier to also detect, hey, this is an, an anomaly. This is something that typically does not happen. So this is probably a thing that goes wrong, and especially those key manager and trust manager options are really valuable if you are in this stage of, hey, I'm trying to connect to something, but the connection is refused, and I don't know why. Well, then, then those two flags are really your friend because they will will tell you a lot of stuff about the, the, the possible causes for that. <laughs>